Hi, everyone. I'm Travis. Uh, I'm an engineer at Honeycomb. I've been there for four months. Uh, I've been uh, in the past, I've done mainly operations side of things, gradually doing more software engineering. Let's talk about uh, agentless integrations and uh, what that means. Uh, and, um, so at Honeycomb, we started recently started building um, an agentless integration for some, um, some, some services. I want to talk about a little bit about kind of our thought process going into that, uh, uh, motivations behind it, some technical challenges we, we ran into while building it, uh, how we're trying to make it easier to use, and I'll follow up at the end with a quick, hopefully working live demo of the thing, uh, just to kind of show you the, the flow and um, kind of what we landed on. Um, cool, so let's get started. Um, prior to Honeycomb, I, uh, I worked at a uh, large uh, conglomerate with a huge enterprise IT shop. Uh, they, were, they lived and breathed ITIL, and um, I was working on a team that was responsible for doing new things in the organization, using new, new technologies. Uh, and they'd really embraced serverless. And after spending some time on the team, I, I came around to, to embracing serverless. And uh, it, it was great not only having to, like, no longer having to work with servers, but all the technical baggage and ITIL baggage around servers, like doing change requests on servers, uh, asset management, um, security compliance, just not having the servers was great and allowed the team to move way faster on things uh, that they were working on and, and, um, and innovate and just kind of skirt the system basically and uh, do things quicker than they were, would, able to, uh, would be able to do with um, servers. Um, that was great. Um, and uh, we really love serverless apps. We were doing, um, we're using uh, some frameworks uh, with Amazon and um, with API Gateway and uh, Lambda functions. And um, as uh, as Amon mentioned in the last talk, though, serverless apps uh, can be hard to debug. So we eventually started looking at observability products. We started talking to some vendors, and we were surprised to find some vendors that were like. No, 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 you need to run an agent to collect data and send it into our system. And we were, we were sort of dismayed when dealing with those vendors uh, when, when evaluating them because this felt like, uh, this felt like a step back in time, um, having to run infrastructure when we were, we were just, for a lot of our services, we just had a code repository and a deploy script, and then boom, magically we had a, we had a service. Um, so we weren't really excited about uh, dealing with infrastructure. Um, and that kind of had an effect on, on our choice of vendor. Um, another thing we found is that vendors that had serverless or agentless um, uh, solutions for, for gathering data were a lot easier to work with, and we could get to uh, value more quickly and um, generally just be more productive with their product. So I forgot all about that until I... Um, uh, started working at uh, at Honeycomb, and I was on the opposite side of that relationship. Now I'm a vendor, or working for a, a vendor, trying to sell to to customers that are trying to understand their serverless systems or their systems in general. And uh, this came back to me, um, and it came back because um, one of the um, things we're trying to do at, at Honeycomb all the time is make it easier and easier for you to uh, have that aha moment with the product. Because um, we think that like, if you, once you get your data into Honeycomb and you can explore it with the tool, um, so, you know, it'll click and you can, um, you'll be able to understand your system and uh, you love the product. Um, but the first hurdle there is actually getting data into Honeycomb. And uh, this, so this, when thinking about solutions for how, how do we make this easier, uh, this experience I had working at the, you know, the last company uh, came back to me. Um, so things we try and get people to do when they're, when they're getting data into Honeycomb is to instrument their code with SDKs, um, structure their logs so that the data is easy to get out of um, whatever, whatever system they have and um, the logs are more meaningful and easier to process. Um, but uh, there's a lot of solutions that involve configuring and, and maintaining agents. Wouldn't it be great if we just get rid of the agent? Uh, and um, it turns out, well, in some cases you can, especially if you're running in, in AWS and you're running 
running with um, running serverless apps. Uh, so let's let's look at like a um, uh, a serverless event flow. Like how how do, how do things happen in a in a serverless app? Um, one one model I, I worked with a lot was just you have an API gateway sits in front of a bunch of Lambda functions, uh, serves your API, you make a request to an endpoint, it calls a Lambda function, Lambda function writes output interesting output to CloudWatch logs. Um, if we just tap into that CloudWatch log uh, with, uh, with the Lambda function or something and send that data to Honeycomb, it would be really easy to get your data into, into the system. But it actually turns out that a lot of Amazon services work this way. You either, um, you either have something going to an S3 bucket, something going to a CloudWatch log, something going to uh, an SNS topic. And if you can just write a, a, a Lambda function that can subscribe to these event streams, you can get data into the system a lot easier. Um, and a lot of, a lot of Amazon uh, services use this model. Uh, their data is generally already structured. Uh, it's usually JSON f uh, in some form. Um, and they all feed into one of these three systems for the most part. Um, so we decided to tackle it from that angle. Um, so we figure AWS services and serverless apps are, are low-hanging fruit if we just write a Lambda function that can can receive events and, um, and send them our way. Um, the, the main challenges we had to deal with were uh, adapting our, our existing code and our existing agents to, to work in this new serverless model. And the other issue was making this easy to use. Because um, if, you've, if you've used Lambda at all, it's not, uh, there are a lot, you'll see, you know, there's a lot of frameworks out there that are de designed to make it easy to use and trying to package up a Lambda solution for someone to just run on their own account uh, within you know, a few minutes is, is um, not always easy. Um, so let's look at the Lambda challenges we had. And this is the, this is the, the technical bit where we look at what ch changes we had to make to our, our agent and our code. Um, we have uh, we have an, we have a lot of tools at Honeycomb already for processing data or ingesting data. Uh, we have our Honeytail agent, uh, which uh, um, is kind of a Swiss Army knife for for ingesting logs. You have, we have a lot of parsers that can handle like Nginx logs or generic regex or JSON or Keyval or glog. Um, we have our Honey AWS suite, which is designed to run and pull logs from ELB, ALB, CloudFront. Uh, we have an RDS logs agent, we have a Kubernetes agent, uh, and a bunch of other tools. Um, but the, the common, uh, common thing here among all of them is that they're long-lived processes and they're designed to pull for data, uh, process it, and send it to Honeycomb. Um, Lambda is different because it's event-driven and there's some key constraints that, that you uh, have to deal with when, when taking, some, you know, taking your existing tools and fitting it in the, the serverless model. Um, the first one we ran into was that uh, only the code in, in your handler is guaranteed to run, um, and everything else may or may not run. Um, so any background code that you expected to run won't run, or won't necessarily run. Um, and that, that bit us when we were taking our, uh, our writing our functions for the first time and um, trying, to send, um, trying to send some events in. So this, we wrote our, our Lambda functions in Go. Uh, this is how we normally set up our Go SDK. We initialize it at the start of the program. Um, we defer close, which is just kind of our cleanup function, which uh, sends any unsent uh, events uh, to Honeycomb when the program exits. Um, and then in our handler, we wrote, uh, you know, we wrote code to process the event, parse it, uh, create a Honeycomb event, and then send it off. Um, this didn't work 100% of the time, and the reason was when, we, when you actually send a Honeycomb uh, event with, with our Go library, uh, it sends it asynchronously. So it just, in, for efficiency reasons, we queue up an event, or we queue up a bunch of events, and either we hit a time threshold or a size threshold and then send it as a batch. Reduces API calls, reduces the amount of work the system has to do. Um, it's generally a win-win. Um, but in a Lambda world, this asynchronous um, code isn't necessarily going to run. So uh, this, this cleanup function that we deferred at the end of the program doesn't actually execute because 
once the handler runs, um, as far as we were able to tell, Amazon just stops running the, the code, uh, and the rest of the program just, just is like asleep. So any asynchronous code that you have going in some thread doesn't work. Um, you, can't, you can't count on it working uh, unless the program has uh, you know, sufficient runtime. So what we were seeing um, with low volumes of events, uh, you, you'd, you'd send the first event, uh, the handler would execute, uh, that maybe take 30, 30 milliseconds. Another uh, call would happen, it would take 10 milliseconds, but you wouldn't quite reach the, th the threshold for a flush. Uh, and then all those events would just sit on this dead container lambda function that, uh, that, that was running. Um, and AWS would kill it eventually because it wasn't doing any work, and the events would just wouldn't go anywhere. Um, so if you had a high volume of events, you'd get more throughput because the, the function would get more runtime, the asynchronous stuff would run, but you, um, Lambda can scale to, to accommodate more load, so you'd have these edge cases where uh, some functions would only process a couple of events, maybe run 50 milliseconds or you know, some small amount of time and never send the event. Um, so we had to deal with that. It ended up being something as simple as writing a, a very low cost flush method and then running that in the handler. Um, and uh, we, so we just had to make updates to our, to our SDK uh, to, um, to work in this new environment. Um, another issue we had when writing our, uh, our S3 handler um, was that Lambda has the maximum execution time of five minutes, and that's configurable, but the highest you can set it to is five minutes. Um, if you're used to processing very large objects, like pulling things down from a bucket that's five gigabytes, 100 gigabytes, uh, you can't do this in, in five minutes um, most of the time um, you, uh, because you have to download the object and then actually process it and send the events. And, it's very hard to squeeze that into the, that amount of time. So what we found is um, we had to document the fact that you, had, you have to work with very small objects um, where inputs are broken up into, into small, small batches uh, and then sent to, to the S3 bucket. Um, and then you just you rely on uh, Lambda to scale horizontally. Um, so you see Amazon follow this model with, uh, with services that log to S3. Uh, ELB will write in like five minute chunks and uh, you'll, you'll get like batches of, of small, small little five minute batches of data that, that represent your entire log and they're a huge pain for humans to try and like pull down and, and parse, but it's, it's meant for this event driven model where you only have a limited amount of execution time. Um, we found that you can kind of get around this if, uh, if you scale up the function um, by increasing the memory, which also proportionally increases the CPU, but it, it comes at a cost and it's not a, a foolproof solution. So you, uh, you, have to, you have to keep an eye out for timeouts and see if you're hitting this, um, if, you're, if you're doing something with, like a, um, with large objects. Um, so the, the takeaways from that were uh, we try and the, when, when working in, in Lambda, we try and do all of the essential work in the handler, and we try and keep the, the amount of, uh, t uh, of events that are coming in very small, so the tasks are, are basically uh, are bite-sized. So the next challenge we have is packaging the Lambda, the f Lambda function. Um, Lambda deployments have more than just Lambda code and Lambda functions. Uh, there, there's bits of, um, of dependencies that they have uh, for example, they need, they need an IAM role. They need to run with an IAM role that has permissions to do things. They need a policy attached to that IAM role uh, th that defines those permissions. Uh, if, you, if you're subscribing to CloudWatch logs, you need to define the subscriptions. Uh, you need to grant CloudWatch or S3 or SNS uh, permission to execute your function and um, some other things, depending on the type of, uh, of, of Lambda function that you're running. Um, tying this all together, we usually use something like uh, CloudFormation or Terraform, but you need some kind of framework to tie it all together to make it neat. Otherwise, you have to tell, you know, tell your customer that, okay, you can create the Lambda function, and then you create all these other pieces, and that's kind of a terrible experience. So we looked at Lambda, or sorry, we looked at CloudFormation and uh, Terraform. Um, but then there's another issue, and that's uh, there's, n there's no like, magical parser that can just handle every type of thing uh, that, that comes at it. You have to tell it, that if it's an Nginx log or if it's a, 
if it's a CSV delimited file, then you've got to tell it, the parser what it's about to handle. So you have to configure the Lambda function a little bit. Um, we based a lot of this integration work on uh, our Honeytail agent, uh, which has a, has a lot of knobs that you can turn. Um, and I'll just give you the help output here, just as an idea. This is page one. This is page two. This is page four. Um, <laughs> and I skipped, I think, a little bit there. Um, so how, do you, how would you customize a Lambda function with, with these flags? You can't, you know, there's not re really a great interface for it. Uh, what you do have are environment variables. And in, in the case of a parser, you may have a lot of environment variables. And so your setup looks, up, looks like something like this. And this is just for a little simple parser. Uh, again, the experience here is not great if you're, uh, if you're trying to make this a turnkey experience for, for uh, folks to use. So we ended up going with CloudFormation because CloudFormation allows, um, uh, allows you to supply defaults and kind of um, kind of steer the, 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 the end user toward, um, toward a small number of inputs while specifying defaults for, for, um, for other things. So uh, in this case, I'm showing a shot of the, um, of the cloud, uh, CloudFormation parameters in the template. Um, default values are specified for most things, and we only uh, require input for a few things that the, the customer actually cares about. Um, and uh, we can specify, uh, when, when we're passing environment variables to the function, we can just, specif we can just um, refer back to these parameters uh, and reduce the amount of things that people have to think about when they're setting it up. Um, so the goal is to use uh, a set of, or to ship the uh, agent list stuff is with a curated list of uh, templates that have same defaults. So if I'm doing a, a VPC flow log, integration, I, I, I can pass the parameters I need just for that, and then I only provide uh, you know, required inputs for a couple fields. Um, and the goal is to use the templates to steer the customer toward the right, the right configuration and so they don't have to really deal with all these Lambda variables and things like that. A uh, small note about security that, was, that we had to deal with. Um, CloudFormation and Terraform and, and Lambda uh, all the parameters and inputs that you supply are, in, are stored in plain text, which is terrible. Um, if I'm, you know, one thing most vendors have in common is that they have some sort of API key. In our case, we have write keys. Uh, in general, it's not something you want to have just sitting out there. Uh, if you create a stack with a honeycomb write key in the, um, in the parameters, and someone has access to the AWS console, they can just go look at the stack and see the parameters in clear text. In a small organization, that's not a big deal. In a big, I don't know, ITIL shop, that's maybe a, maybe a non-starter for some folks. So we need, a, we need a slightly more secure option. So what we did was leverage uh, AWS uh, key management service to do uh, encryption of the key. Um, we allow the customer to, to optionally encrypt their key, the right key with uh, the key management service, uh, grant the Lambda function access to decrypt the key, uh, via I, I am role, and um, this allows hopefully the customer to sleep a little bit better at night. Um, here's just a little example of how it would work. You take your honeycomb key, run a CLI command, get, get a cipher, get the ciphertext blob, and you pass that to the CloudFormation template. Um, and then your Lambda policy has access to uh, d decrypt that key and only. Um, and only keys encrypted with that KMS key. Tying all that together, and I uh, just wanted to just kind of demonstrate what the, what the flow of this looks like. Um, Amazon has this nice, uh, nice little feature um, where you can pass, you can provide a link to CloudFormation, uh, the CloudFormation console, and pass a template uh, on a uh, just a standard HTTP URL that you publish somewhere, and when you click that link, you're taken right to the CloudFormation console with um, with a little wizard to bootstrap that that stack. Um, you can look at the uh, the template here and see what resources are getting installed in your environment. Um, there's a there's a few things here. Um, so the demo I'm doing is. Uh, um, an example of our cloud, 
or sorry, our uh, VPC flow log integration, which uh, if you've not used VPC flow logs, you basically configure it to um, configure your VPC to write to a CloudWatch log group, and then it starts start spewing network logs. And those are, the, depending on your organization, those can be really interesting. Um, so we've got a little simple integration here to pull those from CloudWatch, send them to Honeycomb. So I'm going to walk through the flow here. Uh, so I've got most of the inputs already supplied. Uh, I have a few required parameters that, that the customer has to be concerned with. So I'm going to give it my um, VPC log group. Um, which is uh, the flow logs in our dog food environment, and I'm going to have those go to Honeycomb. I'm going to send my write key, but I'm not going to paste that here in the presentation because that would be a bad idea. So what I'm going to do is copy this encrypted blob that I did beforehand. Paste that in, and then I give it the key that I was using to encrypt that blob. Um, and the presence of this key tells the Lambda function, hey, this key is encrypted. Try and decrypt it with KMS first before, um, before using that and sending that to Honeycomb. So I'll send that along. Just click Next through the wizard. And uh, I check this box saying, yes, I'm going to create an IAM role. Um, the IAM role has the absolute minimum resources it needs to, to do its job. It doesn't, um, doesn't have anything else. So um, we try and use, use uh, IAM roles that, that are limited so that it's, you know, you're not opening up um, the customer to, to you having access to their systems in, in ways that you don't intend. Um, so I'm just going to wait for a second for this to create. So you can see all the resources that had to be created for this to work. Uh, it creates the creates the Lambda function, but it also creates this KMS policy, creates a policy that allows the Lambda function to write to CloudWatch, uh, uh, creates the IAM role, can creates the execution permissions. All this stuff kind of awful to, t to, to create manually, individually, but ties, you know, works really nice in the CloudFormation template. So I've got a working um, function. And if I'm lucky, the logs have um, sent events already, yeah. So I'll have a data set here, and I have events coming in, and I can, in Honeycomb, and I can, so I've got data coming in already. And that flow is like two minutes or something for, for someone. Um, and that's, that's, that's the current state. Amazon has this uh, serverless repo, oops, that uh, is supposed to make all this way easier. Um, we'll see how that goes. It's only been around for two months, but uh, they are allowing vendors to publish uh, serverless functions and, and all of their re um, related resources in this kind of kind of it's kind of like the the AMI store where you can just go in and say I want to install this thing, and so you'll be able to go in, in in a few months and go I want to install the Honeycomb VPC flow log integration and just click the button, give it a little bit of input, and then it'll install on your account. Um, so I'm really, exci really excited about that. Uh, it's not ready to go yet. Um, there's some bugs um, with that uh, the serverless application model that they're working on. So um, we've got the, the integrations out there published uh, as beta right now. You can go play with them now in, in our repo. Uh, we call them the agentless integrations for AWS. Uh, and um, I have the obligatory sign-up link for uh, tri the Honeycomb trial. Thanks.